and focus our minds and our hearts on the Lord, and we'll accomplish what we come to this place for today. Several things going on. Uh, first of all, uh, trustees, if I could, just for a few moments after the morning worship, I have some paperwork for you. Uh, right after the service, I'd like to meet you in the gorgeous classroom, our trustees, if you will. Uh, and then uh, other things that are going on, our women's monthly Bible study is coming up this coming Tuesday uh, at 1030 out of the mobile unit. Uh, Phil Resnick is going to be presenting the Jewish Fall Festivals, and this is one of the women's Bible studies that everybody's invited to, men, uh, men as well. Uh, we had uh, a member of our congregation that had a, a vision and a burden placed on their heart. Uh, we had a seven Tuesdays until election time, and uh, a call to God's people to pray. Uh, wherever you are, we're asking if you'll join with us on this. And we've invited the churches of our association uh, and around uh, to participate uh, with us in this. Uh, every Tuesday at 7 o'clock in the evening, if you will just put aside whatever you're doing and focus in and have a touch prayer for our election, upcoming election, and for our nation as well. And we'll join together that way. Uh, I think that's a wonderful uh, vision to have. And if you'll join us, we would be much, much obliged. Uh, bear that in mind. Every Tuesday, from this coming Tuesday up through uh, election time. Uh, other things that are going on on Christmas and Christmas Child's got God given talent night uh, coming up. That's the annual shipping cost fundraiser. That is coming up this Saturday, the 28th. Uh, chicken dinner begins at 6 o'clock. And it's followed by a unique worship where uh, folks uh, share talent from our, our church in that service. Uh, there are sign-up sheets available on the altar, both for the dinner, so we know how much to get, and also if you'd like to share a God-given talent, we certainly want, uh, want to include you. Uh, that There's a sign-up sheet for that as well. It's fast approaching our time for our 180th anniversary as a church. Uh, it's coming up on October the 6th, Sunday, October the 6th. Uh, we have our regular services, Sunday school, uh, uh, Sunday morning at 9.45, uh, 11 o'clock uh, is our morning worship service. Uh, in between, we'll have a dinner on the grounds, and then at 2, we take up for a special music afternoon service. A great time of, of celebrating 180 years, uh, if you will, and plan on staying for the dinner. If you'd be so kind as to sign the sign-up sheet on the organ uh, as we're catering that meal. We want to make sure we have enough. Uh, our Joy Senior Group, they're going to Lock Media once more in November, November the 8th to be exact, uh, and they're going to see the play Holiday Inn. Uh, they'll be leaving the church at 9.30, getting back about 4 in the evening. Uh, they have two tickets left is all that they have. Uh, the cost for those tickets are $70, which includes everything, transportation on the bus, uh, the play, and the meal as well. There is a sign-up sheet on the organ for that also. Please bear in mind uh, that our last broad state mission offering, we reached and exceeded our goal. Our goal was 1,500. We received, right today, 2,851 dollars. And I praise God for that. Uh, now, this is still the month for uh, state missions. If you'd like to continue to give, uh, certainly uh, continue to give. But above everything, continue to pray for our many state missionaries and the fine job they do right here in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Oh, I failed to mention to you about Sunday School. If you uh, work with us this morning, we want to invite you next week at 9.45. Today, here's what happened in our Sunday School. We had 53 present in our Sunday School, and we had uh, 20 contacts. So uh, bear that in mind. Are there other announcements before we go? Yes, ma'am.
us up in a word of prayer this morning. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we give you the thanks for this time, God. Thank you for this fellowship we have with you, the church, and the other man. Open our minds and hearts to ask for things for us today. We ask you to turn your place towards this church and give us direction as we go on our day and worship you. Lord, this is our same prayer. Good morning. Good morning. 586, please. We've a story to tell to the nations. May we stand.
the cloud. Four hundred and ninety. Please stand here, please. Stand as you can.
Amen. Amen. We can take the Bibles with me this morning and turn to 2 Timothy and chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. I'm going to look at the first eight verses. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. And I want to encourage all of us to go, go deeper this morning. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. Here's what God's word said. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach to others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man of war hath entangled himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned except he strive lawfully? The husbandmen that laboreth must be first partakers of the fruits. Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. May God bless his word today. There is a place that is some 25 miles north of the Sea of Galilee. That is referred to as Caesarea Philippi. And in fact is a part of the current Golan Heights area. It lays in the shadow of Mount Hermon. And Mount Hermon itself, whenever it's ice caps, when they melt, uh, do melt, they supply clean and fresh water. Uh, springs they create and those waters flow on to the Jordan River. It makes an abundant water supply. And that abundant water supply has made that area very fertile and very attractive, and it has been for a long, long time. So much so that back in the day, it was used as a Roman resort. Not only was it used as a Roman resort, it also was a place, in many instances, of religious worship. Now, in Caesarea Philippi, there is an area within its confines, and that area is called, or was called at one point, the Gates of Hell. I'm serious, 100%. The Gates of Hell. And that was what the Romans called it in the early days. Josephus, the early historian of uh, the first, second century, he described it in his writings. He described it as a deep cavern filled with water, the bottom of which no one has ever reached. And because of that, because it was seemingly bottomless, the Romans believed that it was a gateway to the underworld. Now, at the time of Jesus, this cave had a different name. At the time of Jesus, it was known as the Grotto of Pan, P-A-N. It was dedicated to Pan, the false pagan god, who, among other things, was God supposedly of fertility. As a result of all that, this god of fertility that was being worshipped here at the Grotto, that worship was horrendous. As a matter of fact, it, it, it involved things that it's not good to speak of in polite society. It involved sacrifices to pain. And I'm not just talking about fruit and such. It involved a fair amount of drinking. It involved sex. Not just human beings and human beings, but human beings and animals. Now I told you that much, at least, to get you to see this. This was not a place where godly people would hang out. This is not a place where good godly Jews like, oh, I don't know, Jesus and his disciples commonly would hang out. But this is exactly the place where Jesus took his disciples. As a matter of fact, that would have been a 70 mile trek. They were coming as we entered the time that they did this, and it's seen in Matthew chapter 16. They were coming from Nazareth, from Nazareth to Caesarea Philippi. That would be about 70 miles. In their day and age, that would have been about a three day hike. All that way, they came on foot, and when they got there, they only visited one place, and the place they visited was the gates of hell. What's up with that? What's up with that is this. Did you realize that that was the place? Did you realize that it was there that Jesus was questioning the disciples? And he said, who do people say that I am? All oh, they say, you're Elias, one of the prophets back from the dead. They say, some say you're John the Baptist risen from the dead. And Jesus stops and he said, yeah, but here's the important thing. Who do you say that I am? That's the place 
where in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, Peter steps up to the plate and makes his great confession of faith. He says, we know who you are. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then later on, Jesus tells Peter, Peter, upon this rock, not upon the rock of Peter, upon the rock of Peter's confession of faith in him and who he was. Upon this rock, I'll build my church. The Lord, to what purpose? And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That's what we read for our scripture call to worship this morning. This is a place where that happens. So Jesus is essentially telling his disciples some big things here. He said, listen, I, I, I brought you here for a purpose. This place is called the gates of hell. These are not the gates of hell. But nonetheless, this makes you think of that. I brought you to this place to tell you this in no uncertain terms. Make no mistake about this. I've come to earth from glory to conquer hell. Amen. That's the reason I've come. I've come to rip the gates right off of Satan's kingdom. And I want you to know something else. The reason I'm telling you this is this reason. You're going to be part of it. My arm is going to be you. I'm going to get the job done by my church. Jesus was going to build His church. That was them. That is us. That's along with other, other believers. And the gates of hell, He said, will not be able to withstand it. Did you, did you get that? It's Amen. not hold the fort. I love that here, but it's not theologically correct. We're not holding the fort. We're on the offensive, not on the defensive. He says you march against the gates of hell, and they won't be able to stand against my church. Your friends this morning, that right there is exactly why we exist as a church. Amen. That's exactly what all those 100 days and years have been about, whether we realize it or not. And that exactly is the reason we as individual Christians that make up this church, we need to go deeper in our faith. Because we have a commission. And our commission is to defeat Satan. And we can't do that in our own power. Our commission is to attack his kingdom even at its very heart. Those are some pretty big orders. And that's the orders Jesus gave to his disciples. And through them, as his disciples also, He's given to us. So, now, how? How, how you might ask me, how are we going to do that? How are we going to do this big thing? How are we going to conquer all of hell? That's where what Paul said to Timothy comes into play. Timothy says, uh, Paul says to Timothy in verse 1, basically, verse 1, look at it again, see if what I'm telling you is not true. Basically, he's saying, Timothy, you got a job to do, right? He says, Timothy, you've got a job to do, but the only way you're going to do your job is only one way. And that is to be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Verse 1. In other words, you don't have to do this thing by yourself, Timothy. You're not alone in this. Don't try to do it by yourself. It can be done, but it can only be done by being strengthened in the grace. Remember the definition of grace, God's riches at Christ's expense? It means the unmerited love of God. Only by the strength that's given us by Christ Jesus can we do this. Can it? You don't have to do it alone. And I got some good things for you today, church. We don't have to do it alone either. We're not alone in this. We're not alone in this. As a matter of fact, Jesus goes right on in and he says, You're not alone in this. Because I'm with you. I am your source of strength. Now, look back here in verse 1 again. Be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Where does this grace come from? It flows to us through Christ Jesus. We don't deserve His power. We don't deserve His wherewithal that we might march against the gates of hell. But He gives it freely nonetheless. Just like Philippians 4.19 says, My God shall supply all your need according to His riches and glory in Christ Jesus. If we've got walking orders, marching orders to storm the gates of hell, we've got a need. And that need is we, we need power because we lack the power. He supplied that need. We do not conquer hell by our own strength. It's not enough. I don't care how strong you are. We do not conquer hell by our own wisdom. It's not enough. I don't care how intelligent you are. We do not 
march against the gates of hell by our own cleverness. It's not enough. If we're going to do it, we're only going to do it one way, and that's by the grace of Jesus Christ. You know, I read something this past week that I found very interesting. In fact, I couldn't put it down because I wasn't aware of, of, of any of this. And I had to read it all the way from the beginning to the end. But these are facts. Uh, someone noted that I read that the early church, when it started, we all know this from biblical records, before, shortly before Pentecost, when the early church started, first century church, first church, when it started, how many people were in that church? About 120. That's what the Bible says. Now, you've got them starting with 120. The day of Pentecost takes place. Now, by the end of the first century, it's believed that there were somewhere in the neighborhood of 10,000 Christians. Think about this. 3,000 of them came forward on the day of Pentecost. But 10,000 Christians in one, one, one century. Now, by the year 200, that figure climbed this. 200,000 believers. By 250, I'm talking 80, of course, there were more than a million Christians in our world who were Christians. By the year 300, Christians numbered over 6 million. And by the 4th century, all on your hats, there were approximately 35 million Christians throughout the ancient world. Now, if you do the math, here's what you're going to find. That's telling us there that Christianity grew about 40% per decade for hundreds of years. Now, now, the question is not how did they survive. They not only survived, they thrived. So the question is, how did they not just survive, how did they actually thrive in the midst of the things they were going through? Please remember in the beginning, Christianity was considered by the religious hierarchy as a depraved religion, as a heresy. Christianity, in fact, was illegal the persecution of Christians was unending. We have record, historical records, that at least two of those persecutions were empire-wide and were designed for one thing, and that was to wipe out and destroy the church. Now, on top of all that, please understand and remember, the earliest Christians, they didn't have church buildings at all. The earliest Christians did not have access to mass media. The early Christians had very little money. The earliest Christians had absolutely zero, no, zilch, political influence. My goodness, they didn't have a Facebook page or a website. They didn't have any of those things. So, how did they survive? Yeah, but how did they not just survive? How did they thrive? They thrived because they depended on the grace of Jesus. And because of the grace of Jesus, they took their faith very seriously. I'm afraid we've drifted a long way from that. In our churches, and our modern churches today, what happens? We get into financial bind. What do we want to do? First thing we want to do, let's get a fundraising drive going. All attendance is down. Well, let's get an attendance campaign going. Our, our church is just not attracting this particular people group that we like to do. So we need to do what uh, they, they think. Well, we need to become a more seeker-friendly church. Now let me say this about that. Each one of those things are not necessarily wrong in and of themselves. Where the problem comes in is when we focus on those things solely to solve the problem and leave God completely out of the equation. That's a problem. And that's where a lot of modern church is today. Jesus is our source of strength in this battle. And by the way, I don't want you to get the mistaken idea of that they just decided to go along with Jesus. It sounds very beautiful. It sounds very romantic. Oh, I'm just going to trust in the Lord. He'll just smooth everything out. It sounds that way. But the fact of the matter is, He also invites us to have a part in it. See, it's not that He's going to do the whole nine yards. This is not the battle of Armageddon where we return with the Lord and we don't even have to lift a finger because the light and the tongue of the Lord defeats the enemies, all of them. We just come to spectate. This is not that time yet. We have a part of it. The early church depended on the grace of Jesus for their strength. They took their faith seriously, but they didn't try to hold along with Jesus. They also depended on each other. 
Look again there at verse 2. Paul tells Timothy, you know the things that you heard of me in, 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 in the presence of many witnesses? Take those things and do what? Entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Delegate. Give it to faithful men because you're not going to be here on the face of the earth forever. I don't know if you realize it or not, but every single one of us, but we're just here for a limited engagement. You know? We say, I'll be here all week. We're not sure of that. We're just here for a limited engagement. And there are people coming behind us. And if, if we don't entrust them, then, then, then the gospel could stop. This is one way that the gospel thrived as well as survived in the early church. They were entrusting to faithful men. A lot of congregations have a mistaken impression that if there's work to be done down at the church, well, we can just hire that work to be done. Hire it out. Somebody needs to be visited? Cool. That's why we pay the preacher. Somebody needs to, uh, to teach kids? That's what we pay the youth minister for. You know, and on and on that idea goes. But that's not how it works. That's not how it ever was designed to work. And I praise God, that's not by large. So that's not how this congregation thinks. Because people here do stuff. People here do stuff. There are folks that run the sound booth for us. And, and are up on the technology for us. There are folks that take care of our music ministry. There are folks that step up and help with our food pantry. And the physical needs of the church. And the serving of the church. And the youth ministry. And the benevolence issues that we face. To try to help people. Various Bible studies. As you've heard. Various prayer groups. Etc. 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 But here's the key. What are we doing there? What Paul told Timothy to do. We're entrusting to faithful men and women and boys and girls who will also be able to teach others as they go on. I want to tell you something. Timothy was probably a pretty good preacher. I like this set up. A little bit before my time, you understand. I don't doubt that Timothy was a fairly competent preacher. I don't doubt that he was able to inspire his audiences. I don't doubt that he would have been able to set the tone of the church, most assuredly. But what's Paul Gallon? Paul's telling him, don't try to do this by yourself. Don't try to do this alone. Get others to help. Get others to step up. Entrust others to teach others as well. Everything we do as a church should be designed to do that. Because if we don't, we're cheating the next generations. Everything we do should be designed to entrust others to do ministry. Did you not realize that's, that's, that's why we have deacons? Now, that was part of God's, God's plan. He set that all in, in motion. That's part of the system God set up and the very wise system so that a church isn't run simply by a preacher somewhere. When the deacons do their job, they do ministry just, just like a, a ministry, just like ours on staff. But it doesn't stop there. It doesn't end there. We have and should seek to utilize many people. And we have and should seek to utilize as many people as possible to do the many and hopefully increasing ministries here at Oakland Baptist Church and any other church that might be hearing this. Because if we do not, what happens? A bottleneck. A bottleneck. If we have only certain people doing the majority of the ministry... That dominance becomes dangerous, frankly, because it creates that bottleneck of opportunity. Nobody else in the church learns, uh, learns to share their faith because only a few end up exercising the gifts that God has, has given them. But what happens when we delegate? What happens when we share the love? What happens when we seek to use as many people as possible? That allows a beautiful thing. That allows people who have the willingness, that allows people who are willing to step up and do the work to get their feet wet and to learn how to share their faith. And folks, frankly, that's the best way to learn how to share your faith. Now, the, the question for you today is this. Do you have a ministry here at Oak Ridge Baptist Church or again, any church that might be hearing this? Paul, Paul's got something very intriguing there in 2 Timothy 2. 
verse 4 and 5 and really onward, he uses, in fact, analogies. You know, this is what it's like. Think of this and apply that to this situation. And the first of the analogies he's using there in verse 4 and 5, look at what he said. He says, share in suffering as a good soldier. There's the analogy. Am I a soldier of the cross? That's a rhetorical question in that hymn. The answer is yes. If you're saved, yes, you are. The question is, do we have a ministry? Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Listen to this part. Verse 5. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits. Since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. A soldier for the Lord. Am I a soldier for the Lord? If I'm saved, yes, I am. A few years back, I stumbled across an unusual fact regarding World War II. My dad served in World War II. Did you realize there were roughly 16 million Americans during that war who served in uniform? That's a lot of men and women. But those 16 million soldiers, the article pointed out, did not win the war all by themselves. Listen to this carefully. Each frontline soldier needed 18 support people to meet his needs each day. So each day, that one soldier of those 16 million needed these 18 support people to do what? To supply him, first of all. And do you realize, again, in that same article, each soldier who was frontline had to be supplied daily with 96 bullets, six pounds of food, and up to 20 pints of water every day. Dear friends, that amounts basically during a month to a ton of material. Yeah, they needed those 18 support people. For every yard that soldier advanced, they needed a team of those 18 support people of, uh, of clerks, of cooks, of mechanics, of medics to service their needs. And that's not counting all the roads and derivatives during World War II. That's not counting the factory workers that were back in the States. The folks that were working in factories here in the States during World War II were working three shifts 24-7. Three shifts, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That labor force in the United States at that time increased by 18.7 million people. Thanks very much in part, by the way, to those rosy derivators. I'm talking about the addition of some 6 million women who abandoned their homemaking pursuits and roles and they flocked to the war plants to produce ships and tanks and planes and ammunition and weapons. Now I told you all that to tell you this. My point is, if you're a soldier of Christ, what are you doing? What are you doing? How are you contributing to this cause that's the heartbeat of the church tearing down the gates of hell? Are you a soldier on the front lines? Are you part of the support troops? Are you devoting a significant portion of your life to make the church be able to contend against Satan? Or are you a wall? Are you away without me? Friends, I hate to confess it to you, but that's been a problem with the church for decades. And it was only magnified by COVID. The fact of the matter is, are you a soldier for the Lord? Or are you able? Now, now think about this in this way. If you were to enlist today in any branch of the military, the Army, the Air Force, the Navy, the Marines, Coast Guard, whatever. Now granted, most of us are over the age limit, but just go with me on this for just a moment. If you were to enlist in one of those branches of armed services, what would those branches of services expect of you? What would they expect you to do? And yeah, I would grant you there would be times that you'd be sitting in chairs and receiving verbal instructions of what was expected of you. Hey, kind of like church, right? But most of the time, they expect you to do something. Most of the time, they would expect you as a soldier in the military to be up to something productive against the goal. You see, that's why the early church grew so rapidly. That's the reason that they grew by leaps and bounds. Most of the church members did things. Most of the church members were actively involved in not just the preacher's ministry or the church's ministry, but hey, I'm part of the church, our ministry, under our leader and commander, the Lord Jesus Christ. 
They took their faith very seriously. Oh, one other thing. Folks, I want to tell you, when we please our Master Commander, He notices. When we please the Lord Jesus Christ, He notices. Notice that Paul says, again there in verse 4, that the soldier's aim is to please the one who enlisted him. Let me ask you a question. Who enlisted you into the church? Well, that'd be Jesus. That'd be Jesus. It's because of His blood that you belong here. So our aim ought to be one aim, to please Jesus. Not to please the rest of the church. Not to please everybody. Not to please the person down the road. But to please Jesus. And folks, we got to remember, this is not a game. This is a war. This is a battle. And it's a battle to end all battles. It's a battle for the lost souls of men and women. And what you and I do or don't do can make all the difference in the world one way or another. Somebody once said something really has stuck with me down through the years. They said, you know, I never want to reach out someday with a soft, calloused hand, uncalloused hand, a hand that never was dirty by serving, and shake the nail-pierced hand of Jesus. Neither would I. I never want to have to stick my hand out and it not have the marks of, of working for Him. We need to take this seriously. Paul uses two other analogies there in verse 5 and verse 6. He goes on and he says, An athlete, analogy number two, is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. And then he says, And a hardworking farmer, that's the husbandman, it's the hardworking farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Why do I, Jesus knows this? someone who competes against Satan and when he notices doing that there's a reward involved with that and it's a crown it's a crown a physical crown, I don't know a heavenly crown, most assuredly what do we do with those crowns? we don't just model them we don't say, hey I got four crowns you got none, what was you? we're not just brag about those crowns we cast them at the feet of the one to whom they belong the Lord Jesus Christ I don't want to go at the end of you that's exactly what Paul was going out later in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8 when he said this. 2 Timothy 4 8 when he said, Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, one of five crowns mentioned in the Bible, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. And folks, when Jesus notices that soldier, that soldier is the Lord. In glory. And when Jesus notices the third analogy, the hard-working farmer who produces a crop, if you will, for the kingdom, what happens? That person gets first share in the rewards. Didn't Jesus say the same thing on the Son on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33? But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. The main point here is this. You and I have a part to play, a vital part to play, in defeating Satan. We have been called, we have been called, to tear down the gates of hell and to destroy the kingdom of Satan and to rescue the lives of the wolves. And that's why we need to grow deeper in our faith. Because this isn't a game. This is life and death. This is heaven or hell. We've got to be committed in taking this thing as far as we can, as hard as we can. I want to close this morning with words from a song that I know you've heard. The song by Ray Waltz. And it says this, I dreamed I went to heaven and you were there with me. We walked upon the streets of gold beside the crystal sea. We heard the angels singing and someone called your name. You turned and saw this young man and he was smiling as he came. He said, friend, you may not know me now. And then he said, but wait, you used to teach my Sunday school when I was only eight. And every week you'd say a prayer before the class would start. And one day when you said that prayer, I asked Jesus and my mom, thank you for giving to the Lord. I'm a life that was changed. Thank you for giving to the Lord. I am so glad you did. It goes on and says that another man stood before you and said, remember the time the missionary came to your church and his pictures made you cry. You didn't have much money, but you gave it anyway. Jesus took the gift you gave, and that's why I'm here today. Thank you for giving to the Lord. 
my life that was changed. Thank you for giving to the Lord. I am so glad you gave it. And finally, he says, one by one they came. Far as the eyes could see. Each life somehow touched by your generosity. Little things that you've done, sacrifices made, unnoticed on the earth, in heaven now proclaimed. And I know that up in heaven you're not supposed to cry. But I'm almost sure there were tears in your eyes. As Jesus took your hand and you stood before the Lord, He said, my child will around you. For great is your reward. Christian, are you a soldier of the cross? Well, yes, you are. But the question is, are you a good soldier of the cross? Are you a good athlete, spiritually speaking, that's striving for the crown? Are you a good, hard-working farmer who has the opportunity to enjoy the first part of the fruits? If not, there's no better time than right now to make the commitment to the Lord to go deeper with Him. And lost person, by that I mean this, there's not a time in your life that you can readily identify. That was the moment when I asked Jesus to be my Savior and my Lord through prayer. If you don't have that moment, we want to invite you to respond. And this morning, we can lead you in, in that prayer to ask the Lord to be not just a Savior or be Savior, but your Savior, which makes all the difference for the good in the world. All right, if there's other decisions, we want to invite you to come during this time to the Lord's invitation to you and me. Let's stand together and we'll say our hymn. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, you do beautifully. <laughs> And three. Fantastic. Randy, I just want to say one quick thing. I had four years of history under Dr. Charles Talbert, a great history teacher at the University of Kentucky. Your sermon today was as, well, was as good as any professor that I had all the way through school, including Charles Talbert, who was great. Your sermon was great, right on the mark, and I love you dearly. You are a great preacher, but you're an even greater teacher. Amen.
Sunday, uh, September the uh, 22nd, I believe it is, isn't it, June? September the 22nd here at Oak Ridge Baptist Church. Great day at service, a great uh, sermon with Randy Wallace and the great choir here, and great organ playing and piano playing. Boy, I tell you what, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. As we pull out of church here, a little handicap ramp there right up the door. June's going to come out on the ladies' Bible study class on Thursday evening. What time is it, June? On Thursday evenings. I think it's around 6.30. 6.30. Yep. Great Sunday here at with Randy Wallace at the Oak Ridge Baptist Church. Praise the Lord and pass the ammunition of Godly principles. Red, yellow, brown, black, and white. They're all precious in Jesus' sight. And there's the old Church of Christ where my brother-in-law, Jackie Robinson, started a preaching career and, and married my little sister, Mayor Ruth Robinson, Stevenson Robinson. I remember when they were courting each other. <laughs> 